2023 was an interesting year. I spent the vast majority of it playing retro games I enjoyed, and then we started playing space games in preparation for Starfield. X4 Foundations, No Man's Sky, Elite Dangerous, Freelancer, Underspace, and more. Games where you spend a lot of time in the cockpit of a spaceship. Somewhat ironic, considering Starfield turned out to barely be a space game at all. Fast forward to today, where a large contingent of the internet is up in arms about Emil Pagliarulo, project lead for Starfield and his mismanagement of the project, poor writing capabilities, so on. Although I ended up enjoying Starfield for all the wrong reasons, I actually wasn't excited for Starfield before it came out. I was showing off this chart, the Gamer Matrix. Some people were angry about this, by the way, me not being excited for next product. But the reality is video game marketing as a whole no longer interests me. I don't care about the Fallout TV series, even if that isn't a game, or Grand Theft Auto 6 trailers. They're just trailers. You're going to have to give me a playable demo for a game to get me at all hyped whatsoever these days. I've lived too long, and I've seen too much. So my expectations were zero. We'll explain how I got to this point, and this will all circle around to Emil Pagliarulo and Starfield. Let's talk about the history of Bethesda Game Studios. Originally called Bethesda Softworks, it would eventually spin off into its own publishing and development branches. But back then, it was just Bethesda Softworks. Daggerfall fans have a massively procedurally generated world with massively procedurally generated towns and dungeons. A few handcrafted ones, but mostly procedurally generated. They... Fans of Daggerfall were later disenfranchised when Morrowind lowered the scale of the world, removed banking, nerfed faction relationships, and so much more. But that's fine, because Bethesda garnered a larger and newer fan base in Morrowind. And then Morrowind fans were disenfranchised by Oblivion's generic world that ignored all the detailed world building Morrowind had been known for. But that's fine, because Bethesda garnered a larger and newer fan base in Oblivion, especially on the console. Then Oblivion fans were disenfranchised by the stripping of the last major RPG elements Oblivion had. But that's fine, because Bethesda garnered a newer and larger fan base in Skyrim, mainly on the console. Now, unfortunately, Skyrim fans really didn't translate to Fallout 4 76 in the same way. But make no mistake, Fallout 4 sold better than 3, and 76, despite all its major problems, the breakout success on release, financially speaking, due to marketing. At any point in this large chain, you could have said, this was my first Bethesda game, and based your entire view on what a Bethesda game was from that point forward. The further you are in the chain, the more likely you are to disregard players of older games as weirdos uh, for saying old game better. And until Baldur's Gate 3 shattered the modern mainstream public's perception on what an RPG was, anyone speaking up about Divinity the Original Sin or even the older Baldur's Gate games in comparison to modern games, they get ignored by the mainstream gaming base as being some kind of fringe weirdo. How could old game be as good as new game? How could old game be better than new game? That's impossible. Old game is archaic and doesn't have the things I want out of new game. But Baldur's Gate, despite all of its quirks, it managed to do one thing. It managed to garner a mainstream audience. For roughly 8 to 10 years, game developers are going to have to put up with constant comparisons. Not from some fringe 20-year or 30-year-old game, but a more modern one. The Skyrim and Fallout 4 fan bases were alienated by Starfield, just the same as Bethesda has always alienated its previous fan bases. This time, however, it failed to acquire a larger fan base. Don't get me wrong, sales were good, but sales are indicative of not a game's quality, but rather the marketing push put behind that game, coupled with any faith that players have had in that game studio. I've seen many generations of Bethesda games come and go, so Starfield's critical failure wasn't a surprise to me. And I'm kind of tired of bringing up Emma Pagliarulu at this point, although that's the point of the video, so we're going to be talking about him later. I just know that the internet is now, for the first time as a collective, waking up to the fact that he is bad at his job. Oh, don't get me wrong, niche communities, smaller groups of people, you know, 
know, smaller critics have been pointing this out. But as we've learned with Blizzard Entertainment, for example, a game company can get away with be either being lackluster or even heinous crimes provided the player base is enjoying themselves the moment the player base stops enjoying themselves as a collective that's when they turn on the particular game studio and we see the reverse is true as well the moment diablo 4 came out a good chunk of the people who were screaming boycott blizzard suddenly mysteriously we're playing Diablo 4. But Emil Pagliarulo is a brilliant level designer. He's good at his job, as evidenced by his earlier work. He's just a case of someone who's been promoted out of their area of expertise, out of their area of talent, and despite that fact, has managed to blunder his way to success several times, despite his increasingly regressive attitudes towards game development. The internet's just waking up to this fact, but for me it's old hat. Let's talk about my personal experience with Bethesda games. My first game was Elder Scrolls 1 The Arena. I wasn't a huge fan of that. Ultima Underworld was functionally a better game in many respects, despite Arena being heavily inspired by Ultima Underworld. I didn't really stick around in the Bethesda space until Elder Scrolls II Daggerfall, but from that point on, I have been around long enough to watch each fan base become disillusioned with their favorite company, which is no longer pandering to them. Me? I'm a crazy person. I've enjoyed every mainline game they put out, including Starfield. Each game has a different draw to me. I don't play Daggerfall for the same reason I'd play Morrowind, and I don't play Skyrim for the same reason I'd play Oblivion. So when someone comes up and asks me, Why are you playing this garbage game? I've seen you play good games. Are you doing this just for viewership? They're all good games to me. At least good within the context of I enjoy playing them. They're each good at different things. But you have to understand I'm not a normal person. The more I like something, the more I criticize it. Because I want mods, fan games, spiritual successors, or with almost a 0% chance of happening, official sequels to learn from that criticism and to obtain a more idealized form. I'm not insisting that they pander to my whims, but I'm going to make those whims known publicly so that maybe someone gets inspired by them. Tamriel has never been a living, breathing world, but rather each game set in Tamriel is a performance piece put on for the player's benefit, and that's fine. I just wish that the developers had been more ambitious. I've often complained about retcons or retroactive continuity changes, but here's the thing. I don't actually care about consistency if the breaks in continuity were done in the interests of making the story and world more interesting. Not more realistic, mind you. I feel that high fantasy should be moving further away from realism, creating more specialized rules to their worlds that break from conventional physics or real-world understandings in order to create not a facsimile of the real world, but rather a place that subverts the rules of the real world, a place that we can't pre-assume how things work. For example, I would like every Everything from biology to chemical reactions to defy real world rules to where a chemist or a doctor would look at the way the human body works in a fantasy world or the way chemical reactions work in a fantasy world and go, this isn't how it works at all. And it's like, damn right, that's not how it works at all. This is a completely different world with completely different foundations. And what you do is you fill in any cracks that appear in that foundation with magic. Daggerfall and Morrowind are both very good at this and have had the existence of magic and or divinity baked into their world building. But when it came to take us to see the dragon riders of Cyrodiil, the airships, the Imperial Navy, all surrounding the biggest metropolis on the continent. My disappointment came not that they betrayed what was written about before. Like, I don't really care if Cyrodiil's a jungle or not, but rather that they didn't even try to match what was written with their own equally ambitious adaptation of it. Rather, the breaks from canon, the uh, ret retroactive continuity changes, they were done in the interests of making development of the video game simpler, easier. That's my problem with it. And that's the real reason I have a tendency to uh, nitpick these things, not because I'm a stickler for you must be consistent all the time, but rather the setting could be better in each successive game 
than it is. Now, I remember people being graphically wowed by Oblivion at the time, but having started gaming in the text-based era, dialing up to bulletin board services, or BBS for short, I've never held graphics as something I would sacrifice gameplay for. Gameplay is why I stuck to the Elder Scrolls when the storylines diverge from interesting, fairly well-written high fantasy world building in Morrowind into the later games, Oblivion and Skyrim's cinematic gobbledygook. Sure, things happen in real time in Oblivion and Skyrim, not in wiki-based dialogue. But the writers who made The Elder Scrolls what it was, especially the ones from Daggerfall, Battlespire, Redguard, and Morrowind, basically all left. The level designers who picked up the pieces and became the writers for Bethesda were able to keep the games at least mildly interesting, or majorly interesting for new players, because they were basing their stories off of smarter world building. World building that had been done for them. Same for Fallout. The people who wrote the foundation of Fallout never worked for Bethesda in the first place. Bethesda just purchased and used the intellectual property to tell their own stories, using the foundation established for them. And I do think we should pay more attention to who made what. However, I'm not fundamentally against living stories that are handed down to new custodians, provided those custodians have the proper reverence for what came before, and not just an ambition to make it my own. Where am I going with this? Starfield was modern Bethesda's opportunity to show us what they could do. The Bethesda inherited a legacy that they've been managing by releasing entries into these franchises. But Starfield was something they couldn't rest on their laurels for. They had to stand on their own. This is the time for writers to shine, to show us what they are capable of. I kid you not, I saw this coming long before Starfield was even announced. Let me explain. A normal person sees something they like or dislike, and they put it into a box called good or bad. But I look at something, and I see a multitude of components that make up that thing. I may be predisposed to like or dislike certain aspects of it, but once I'm experiencing a product, I'm usually deconstructing it in real time, coming up with lists of things about it I like or dislike. I can disregard all kinds of things I don't like in a product. if the core experience is still enjoyable to myself and my goals within the game. Usually, that goal in a sandbox game is to get lost in the world and just have an experience exploring the world. So when people come to me mid-playthrough and go, what are your plans for this character? I usually grumble. I think about it for a second based on the character's backstory and what's available. And then I usually say something stupid that um, probably isn't true because I don't actually have a plan because I'm usually feeling my way through these fantasy worlds. And I love doing that. It's the journey, not the destination. And although certainly the character eventually amounts to something, usually a spellblade, because I freaking love magic swordsmen, what I'm trying to get at more than anything else is that I typically just jump into a sandbox to have fun. And the character will go in all manner of directions based on that single principle not some overt goal. And when I do have an overt goal, it has a tendency to get waylaid or completely obliterated. And that's fine. That's more than fine. It's great, actually. It's the buzzword that the industry used for about 10 years called emergent gameplay. And I can really only get it from sandbox games, either The Elder Scrolls Fallout or something uh, more like Mountain Blade or Kenshi. But... Whereas I like Mountain Blade a lot, um, Kenshi's a big ask for me. The vast majority of my preferences, however, when it comes to games, are non-exclusionary. What I mean by that is just because I like pancakes doesn't mean I hate waffles. As you know, the internet very much proclaims, Oh, he doesn't like Portal 2 as much as Portal 1. He must hate Portal 2. Which is not true at all. But the earlier Fallout games are a point of contention because I hated Fallout 1 and 2's combat when that's all I had to play. That's all that was accessible to me at the time for Fallout content. But I loved its storytelling, so I put up with gameplay I didn't necessarily care for in order to get more of that story. We didn't have YouTube 
back in the day where we could just watch the story. So if I wanted to see the story of Dune 2000, I had to play real-time strategy campaign, which I personally found to be stressful and off-putting. These days, less so, but that comes from experience. I like a lot of games from a lot of genres. First-person shooters, 2D side-scrolling platformers, space flight games, hack-and-slash ARPGs, turn-based JRPGs, and more. One of my favorite sub-genres would have to be the dungeon crawler. From Wizardry to Atarian Odyssey to Legend of Grimrock, I do love a good dungeon crawl. That's actually the main reason, despite all its faults, I loved Elder Scrolls II Daggerfall at the time. Now I have many more reasons to love Elder Scrolls II Daggerfall because we have mods which transform the experience beyond recognition. But back when it was a fast travel and dungeon crawling simulator with a few town components attached to it, I loved it for the dungeon crawling. Now with the right assortment of mods, it is so much more than that. The gameplay loop of Daggerfall can be fundamentally altered, and that's a great thing. So people heavily criticized Fallout 3 for being a bad Fallout game, and I'd agree. People heavily criticized Fallout 3 for having a bad main story, and I'd agree. People heavily criticized Fallout 3 for having poor world building, and I'd agree. World building is an element of storytelling, and although those two words together sound a lot like world design, they are not the same. What Bethesda has traditionally been good at, although they'll screw this up in Starfield, but just talking about Fallout 3, in Bethesda games, their world design is the main character, the draw, the thing that other companies that make open world games can't excel at. And that's because they're too busy filling these empty sandboxes with activities to do. Fallout 3 for me was a dungeon crawler. Bad storytelling that gets compartmentalized in my head as a LOL moment and ignored in favor of the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay, which is getting lost in an open world and, more importantly, exploring subway tunnels, abandoned buildings, you know, dungeon crawling. After that, I experienced Fallout New Vegas, and I got the best of both worlds. These days, I will only ever visit Fallout 3 inside of New Vegas via the Tale of Two Wastelands overhaul so that I can get the benefits of both games when revisiting Fallout 3. New Vegas isn't a perfect game by a long shot, but modern Bethesda is entirely incapable of writing to that level, I believe. If they want to prove me wrong in their next entry, it would make me very happy. If being wrong is beneficial to me, then let no ego stand in the way. So, at least for me, having been a Daggerfall and a Morrowind fan, Oblivion and Fallout 3 were huge, glowing, red flags about bad writing built on top of better writing. But I enjoyed the gameplay, so I compartmentalized the dislike for the story and continued to enjoy the games. I don't deny the writing for these games is bad, but I can definitively say that I like Oblivion and Fallout 3 as video games. But if you wanted to know exactly when I personally started getting critical of Bethesda, that's when. For many people, these were the good times they reminisce about, either Skyrim or Oblivion. Remember. Each generation gets disenfranchised and replaced with a newer fan base. Vanilla Skyrim, at least for me, lasted far less playtime than previous games in its vanilla state, but much longer in modded content that transformed the game into a collectathon. I have had exactly nine, based on a little like chart I have here, uh, nine people. Um, come at me in a crazy sort of way and argue that modding does not make a game better, that does not actually give it longevity. It is true that you need to have a solid foundation to mod with, and it's true that there are some aspects of games that cannot be fixed with mods. However, longevity is exactly what modding provides. Having been modding Doom since the early 90s, I would vehemently disagree with anyone saying otherwise. By the way, Doom 1's co-creator John Romero has put up a new Sigil 2 expansion pack this year in mod form. It's not the best Doom mod ever created, but it's authentically Romero in the same way that the Mona Lisa isn't the best painting ever made, but it's authentically Leonardo da Vinci. We come to these products for the artists, not necessarily because they are the best expression of that art medium ever made. And yes, I did have the audacity to compare John Romero to da Vinci. With all the awareness in the world that I'm doing it, I will do things like that again. Nothing 
is sacred. Having made countless maps for Doom, Quake, and Half-Life to play at LAN parties, I can confirm that content is king when it comes to games. So when Fallout 4 came around, I was already on alert from Skyrim's shortcomings, but I knew that modding and the right attitude could create a fun experience in Skyrim regardless of those shortcomings. Despite dozens of hours of criticism laid at the feet of Skyrim, it remained a fun sandbox to romp through, especially when modded. So, when Fallout 4 presented me the most asinine story to date, I was of two minds. First, with just the right mods, just like with Fallout 3, I love the dungeon crawling in Fallout 4 and I want more of it. Every office building or ruin was a dungeon for me to crawl through and I was going to enjoy the hell out of it. Second, I had to know where this nonsense writing was coming from. Unlike Daggerfall and Morrowind, where former employees were pretty much free to speak about their experiences making the product, from Skyrim and Fallout 4's era, if you even wanted to interview at Bethesda, you had to sign a non-disclosure agreement to even get in the interview. That meant you were legally barred from discussing the interview questions or even what they'd offered to pay you. So from this point onward, any sources you might have had to be anonymous, not only to protect them from being fired by Bethesda, but from potentially being sued by ZeniMax Media, or worse, blacklisted from the industry. Other companies go, this person can't be trusted to keep secrets. Uh, we can't hire this guy. So as a result, sources will now, these days, only provide the most basic information as to remain untraceable. Because if they figure out, oh, hey, this information came from this particular person because no one else you know, knew all the details about that, or no one had those specific interactions with, um, say, Emil Pagliarulo, insight into the development of Fallout 4 was pretty lukewarm. That was until Emil himself went on camera for the story conference, and that talk was uploaded seven years ago. I almost immediately clipped the section where he discussed KISS. Keep it simple, stupid. What's the story with Bethesda stories? How do we make our stories? KISS. Keep it simple, stupid. This is my own personal rule for myself, right? Keep it simple, stupid. What does that mean? When I'm coming up with a story for a game, I like to concentrate on strong central themes. You know, Skyrim. Skyrim is a game about dragons, right? Even in the studio. What is the game about? It's about dragons. But the story is not really about dragons, right? It is about the lone hero. It is much more biblical than any a lot of the other stories we've done. It's about a, the, the dragonborn, the Dovahkiin, is much more of a messiah sort of character. And used as an Elgato stream deck button I could hit during live streams. Anytime the lackluster storytelling came up, I could just hit the button of Emil Pagliarulo revealing how much disdain he had for good storytelling in video games while I had a uh, drink of coffee or water or whatever. I'm very fond of catch-alls for or frequently asked questions. So between that and Todd Howard's explanation of our designers are our writers. Um, what do you look for when considering a new writer? That's a tricky one. Actually, our designers are our writers. So obviously we look at writing samples. Um, you know, it's another thing where uh, most people who do video games tend to overwrite. We overwrite. Like we are, we write way too much stuff. Um, most people who play Fallout, I watch them play it. We wrote all this brilliant stuff. And they get to a guy and they're like, just jamming the button. Shut up, 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 shut up. Oh, that's who I kill. Thanks. So I think the trickiest thing to do is to write really short things just to get the information across. But our writer, we don't have anyone as a sole writer. They're also quest designers, level designers. So if you're looking for that kind of thing, we would look for, like on a quest design, you really have to understand some programming language. We'd look for a quest, like here's what the player does, here's what the characters say, that kind of stuff. I had solidly set my expectations to zero when it came to Fallout 76. My point here is that while most people are just now, this year, processing Emil Pagliarulo bad. I did that seven years ago. I'm over it. I'm shredding paperwork from back then now because I don't legally need to keep it anymore. And beyond Fallout 4, the reception of Fallout 76 fell flat. I covered Fallout 76 several times, so we'll skip over the initial release where I made fun of it. I made fun of it a lot. 
after they tuned up some of the game, I ended up returning and I enjoyed it dungeon crawling. However, I had to, to gain full enjoyment of it, pay a monthly subscription to fix their broken problems, problems they manufactured. But yes, despite all that, I had fun with Fallout 76. Now you may be wondering, what about that new dialogue the NPCs added? Well, you get more dialogue choices than you did in Fallout 4, but the actual NPCs, their characterization and place in the story is not great. It's perhaps the worst Fallout piece of media I've interfaced with when it comes to story. Maybe the Brotherhood of Steel? Not to be confused with Fallout Tactics Brotherhood of Steel, which is a different game. Uh, maybe the Brotherhood of Steel's, like, worse, possibly, but uh, not by a whole lot. The story isn't the main draw. The main draw is exploring this gigantic sandbox four times larger than Fallout for and crawling through different dungeons so when people say you enjoyed fallout 76 why aren't you playing it now well that's because i already explored all of it it's not like i can add mods or anything to add more content once i'm done i'm done I'm not going to grind the game for a perfect legendary weapon. That's an activity for gambling addicts. Absolutely nothing like grinding Pokemon for seven hours to get a perfect hidden stat Charmander from the Burn Tower in Johto. All to win. Look at those stats. All 15s. So, Fallout 76 confirmed to me what I had already come to understand. I do not come to Bethesda games for the story anymore. I no longer care about the future of Tamriel or Fallout's worlds in a similar way to how I no longer care about Blizzard's worlds, such as Sanctuary or Azeroth. In both settings, I can still find good dungeon crawling out of them in a first-person shooter format that is overly relaxing, not too complex. Every game from Daggerfall to Fallout 4 hits a comfort zone in a different way. These aren't engaging games to push me to any sort of limits. These are casual games for casual enjoyment. My stating this is a point of disconnection for a lot of fans who feel the need to buy into every aspect of a product instead of enjoying parts of it. My approach to The Elder Scrolls is now to enjoy each game in a bubble, as it was intended at the time of its creation. Say I'm playing Daggerfall. I take that game as presented, modified by mods and my own personal expectations, of course, but exclude the existence of Elder Scrolls 3, and the warp in the West isn't a consideration on how my playthrough goes. That's because... The developers of Elder Scrolls 2 were contemplating an Elder Scrolls 3 set in the Somerset Isles called Tribunal, which was going to deal with the plot hook of Morgaia leaving to become Queen of Firsthold, a game that does not exist, save some references in lore books. Likewise, when sitting down and playing Elder Scrolls 3, we look at the lore when it was written, excluding the possibility of an oblivion crisis, the septum line ending, all of that all nonsense. No need to look at the lore implications of future games, since the developers who made Elder Scrolls 3 no longer work for the company for the most part. We'll discuss the brand worship problem later. Let's just say there's a solid reason I don't do lore videos anymore, and that's because I don't respect the direction the writing has gone, especially having gone back again and enriched myself in the older lore. There are people out there to whom the setting of Tamriel or Fallout is everything. People who boggle their minds employing mental gymnastics to force all of the disconnected pieces of the setting to fit together. To those people, my attitude personally comes off as insanely disrespectful to their headcanons, or worse, to a significant amount of ego that they've placed into the brand. However, I legitimately have fun playing games this way. The funny part is my perspective is no different from the founding principle of CODA, the fundamental rejection of canon. But amending there is no canon only levels of good ideas into the snobbish there is no canon only different creative minds and we should pay more attention to the intent of the work as it was created at the time than the direction future creative minds decided to take it as a base and then of course modifying our games without through our personal desires via mods that is how headcanon functionally manifests within our playthroughs is what mods we choose to use. This isn't a fundamental rejection of Bethesda Game Studios products as a whole, but rather the dissection of those products and the lack of respect their storytelling efforts have mirrored back upon them. ML Pagliarulo famously saying that if you write the next great American novel, 
the players will rip out the pages and make paper airplanes and they won't see the great stories you've written and that's the bitter pill they have to swallow making these games so to draw a conclusion from that statement emma made why bother and that's the only conclusion i can come to when i see starfield in its full and final form compared to a game set in tamriel based on world building he did not make uh, a game set in the fallout universe based on world building he did not make so with starfield my expectations were that i was going to hate the game i didn't but that's what i expected going into it the characters writing world building i can't say i was too far off unless the developers compromise on their artistic vision and fundamentally rewrite and expand the game the story of starfield is simply irredeemable not only to myself but to the majority of people who speak out about the story of starfield starfield's open worlds also fundamentally failed to capture what no man's sky did within a procedurally generated landscape wandering around an empty planet no man's sky gives you resources such as buried technology modules supply depots planetary harvesters and so on that all contribute to the core gameplay loop Starfield's Empty Worlds, on the other hand, contain nothing but optional crafting ingredients, noting that crafting is compartmentalized off into a tiny part of the game that is really only accessible to any serious depth by investment of perk points. Perk points that could be invested into weapons or piloting or crew management, anything here and now that does not require excess resources. The only thing that Starfield's Empty Worlds have for them are points of interest oddly enough when i say starfield was made just for me and that i love it i'm talking about those points of interest dungeon crawling it certainly wasn't made for fans of bethesda open worlds it certainly wasn't made for fans of world building of the elder scrolls or fallout it certainly wasn't made for fans of climactic storylines where your choices really matter since you can always just hop in the unity and do it over no the game was made specifically for me some dude who wants to dungeon crawl in some random point of interest for 200 hours and then drop the game like a rock most likely never to return people ask me to this day has your opinion on starfield change and it's a firm no i enjoyed the dungeon crawling memorized every dungeon now i'm done with it unlike daggerfall morrowind oblivion fallout 3 skyrim and fallout 4 starfield as of now i would not revisit it it's going to need more content and if that content does come in the form of dlcs or mods it'll likely be a year or more before i'm ready to revisit it assuming that content comes at a decent rate if not it may be several years until i revisit it assuming it isn't paywalled chunks via creation system i don't mind ultimately being done with starfield as there are tons of games in the past where i've gone yeah i enjoyed that game do i want to revisit it no and starfield would be the first mainline bethesda game to join that club it's a distinct possibility is the criticism starfield getting deserved absolutely the game is a mess the mainstream audience is now feeling exactly what older bethesda fans have felt in each generation and now there's a volume of unprecedented discontent being directed at emma pagliarulo which considering he is the lead responsible for the game is fair companies are not monoliths games are not created by faceless corporations they have actual human creators and those companies then ask you to buy and even evangelize their products ml pagliarulo is the progenitor of starfield he is the one most responsible unless he wishes to abdicate that responsibility to other individuals i would very much be interested in hearing the real behind the scenes at bethesda story i don't know if he's free to tell it i suspect he's not but it would be interesting to hear for now we can only assume what we are told is true which is emil pagliarulo proudly presents us with starfield proudly proud of the fact that he did not use a central design document proud of the fact that everyone kind of does their thing in a bubble proud of the storytelling that they have made for it who else are we to look at and judge is it microsoft if so who at microsoft the people you place in front of the game in interviews and things of that nature are the ones we are going to have a beef with because who else is there
But let's look at things from Emil Pagliarulo's perspective, or let's put it like this, the version of Emil Pagliarulo that exists in my brain. You have to understand how insane things would be if I were in his shoes. Each game he's helmed has been a financial success greater than the previous. Because each game has garnered a newer, larger fan base, we don't, we don't know about the whole shedding the previous fan base, we just know about the, uh, the bigger one, right? <clears throat> so it just confirms that what they are doing is correct. Even with Starfield, when calculating sales during launch week, or even month, this is one of their most financially successful games of all time. Imagine being an individual who does not really listen to criticism, being told this is your biggest hit yet, you are amazing. Then, turning around and being allowed to speak publicly about your game without being banned by oppressive non-disclosure agreements like you were under ZeniMax Media, Microsoft has freed you to talk about this thing publicly. And so you do. And the internet attacks you viciously. You're, everyone at your studio, everyone in your company is telling you 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 hit it out of the park. Top sales. Internet attacks you. How can both of these exist at the same time? The only way to rationalize these two conflicting states is is to kind of look at the naysayers as bad actors who just don't get it. That's my theory anyway. I can't prove what's going on in Emil's head because it's his head, not mine. However, I can speak briefly about a 15-post Twitter thread he made defending his choices on the game. Well, not so much defending as condemning naysayers. Emil basically said you aren't qualified to criticize him if you haven't been making video games. You're, you're disconnected from the process. It's a logical fallacy in the same vein as appeal to a authority. You can go look at that up on Wikipedia. Anytime someone has ever said to you, I'd like to see you do better or come back when you've done what he's done. That is a logical fallacy known as appeal to accomplishment. Trust me, dudes, I'm really good at this thing. So unless you're equally good at this thing, you can't criticize it. In years past, I've heard this fallacy used by fans to deflect criticism against products they put too much of their egos into. When someone identifies a product, becomes branded by that product's brand itself. They have, they have that brand seared into their flesh. They lose all objectivity, and they should mostly be ignored. Luigi Avatar, don't talk to them about Nintendo stuff. Robert Space in Industries Avatar, don't talk to them about Star Citizen. If someone clearly exhibits the traits of being branded emotionally, by that product, by that brand. It is very unlikely that they actually think critically about the product and that their logic and reason is being funneled to serve their passions. In other words, they will see their perspective as completely logical, completely reasonable, completely factual, but in reality, it's being twisted to protect their ego. So those people from whom I've heard those arguments before, I did not expect that argument from a seasoned game developer who should know better. Someone who is representing not only a company, but a brand. Sure, it's easy to ignore criticism if you're contractually bound by a non-disclosure agreement not to respond. But here, under Microsoft, the NDA has either been removed or lessened, and we get outbursts like these. I'm not arguing in favor of NDAs. I'm bound by a few myself, and it sucks. This speaks more toward the temperament of the man, who likely can't comprehend why he's being given such severely contradictory information. People want me to make a huge video hating on him and deconstructing the bad decisions he's made. But again, I've had seven years to process that he's a bad writer, and I don't come to Bethesda games for the writing anymore. The internet is just finding out about this in current year, and it must be devastating for some people. The generational cycle has come around again and disenfranchised the majority of the Bethesda fan base, and that sucks. I want people to have fun and enjoy themselves. I don't want people to have bad games. And I don't want to hate Bethesda for making bad games. I'd kill, I would kill to have a game as functional as Skyrim with Daggerfall's character creation and leveling systems, with Marwyn's world building expertise, and the sense of wonder that Oblivion first inspired when exploring the landscape. I'm convinced it's impossible and we've established that I'm not normal and that I still enjoyed Starfield over 200 hours despite making an overwhelmingly negative video about it. So I'm basically done talking about this with one exception. A simple consideration. When I played Morrowind 
Everyone talked about Fargoth, Caius Cassades, Crassus, and other experiences in the game world. When I played Oblivion, everyone talked about the Gates of Oblivion, Emperor Patrick Stewart, Sean Bean, the Adoring Fan, the Grey Prince, so on. When I played Fallout 3, everyone talked about Three Dog, Republic of Day, Paradise Falls, and the questionable things you can do with that, wink wink, Megaton, and Mr. Burke's bid to blow it up. When I played Skyrim, everyone mentioned Arrow to the Knee, which, by the way, the meme is wrong. The actual line is Arrow in the Knee. The Cloud District, Stormcloaks vs. Imperials, Alduin's Big Reveal, Serana, Harkon, Merax, so much more. When I played Fallout 4, we got everyone disliked that. We got the resurgence of Vault Boy and Vault Boy related uh, everything. And of course, heavy rain references with Sean and uh, Settlement Needs Your Help. The internet has had massive things to say about each of these games in a not purely negative context. The loudest of these sentiments congealed together to form what we refer to as memes. Memes, for those who are unaware, relate to a concept that predates the internet, known as mimetic theory. The principle behind it is that ideas are memes are akin to living things similar to bacteria or a virus, and use people to reproduce and spread. Memes compete for headspace, so only the strongest, most impactful survive to mutate into other less or more impactful strains, which propagate all over the internet. So if you think I'm saying Starfield failed because almost no Starfield memes, that's not it. The lack of memes is a symptom of a larger problem. So outside of vitriolic criticism, well deserved, by the way, considering the expectations placed upon the uh, product due to marketing. Aside from that point, the game has no mind share. I often critique media as being all flash and no substance. Sometimes I enjoy things that are all flash and no substance. But what happens when something is neither flashy by the standards of its contemporaries, nor does it have any substance? The Elder Scrolls and Fallout have substance because they lean on material written by people who no longer work for the company or never worked for it in the first place. Starfield can't make those claims. Starfield lives or dies based on the competence of the writer and more importantly, the leadership of the product project. Project, leadership of the project, geez. A project that didn't have a central design document and expected everything to just fall into place and magically be great. All I'm saying is Starfield has no cultural impact, or rather, Starfield has no meme. This may change when updates and mods come to the table, but there's also a good chance it won't. Only time will tell. No real good way to segue into this, but I kind of want this video done with, so procedurally generated dungeons are great. I enjoy them. It's a shame that Starfield's dungeons are not procedurally generated. In 2023, they could not do what Elder Scrolls II accomplished in 1996. Admittedly, the engines are different, but they had years to get a senior software engineer in there and build the tech. They chose not to. That's why, now that I've played all of Starfield's dungeons, I am more likely to play a $5 indie game on Steam called Star Explorers, the Interstellar Dungeon Crawler, because those dungeons are procedurally generated. Starfields are not. Now that I've experienced hours of wandering landscapes in Starfield, I'm more likely to play No Man's Sky, where planetary exploration feels meaningful and you collect items to progress your character. Now that I've experienced hours of poorly done space combat, I can go back to Elite Dangerous, Freelancer, or countless other space games. Now that I've experienced Starfield's laughable main quest, I'm more likely to go back to Daggerfall, Morrowind, or even Fallout Tale of Two Wastelands. What I'm saying is everything Starfield attempts to do, other games have done better in pieces. The only reason I advocate for Starfield at all is the dungeon crawling. And unless they add a significantly larger number of them, I'm done with the game. Now, rather than ending on a negative note, to the people out there saying we will never get a Marwind again, you are 100% correct. Modern Bethesda has proven themselves incapable without major shakeups in not only manpower allocation, but general leadership. However, rather than wallowing on that fact, Let's look at the indie space and find some games that might scratch your itch. First, there's a game in early access called Dread Delusion, which focuses on an open alien world akin to Morrowind, with mechanics reminiscent of a modernized Kingsfield. Next up is Tainted Grail Fall of Avalon, which is a little further along than the previous game, but still not complete yet. It exudes a solid Oblivion vibe. Finally, 
If you want a world directly inspired by Morrowind, with combat mechanics inspired by Skyrim, with a reputation system based on Fallout New Vegas, check out Ardenfall, which has a free demo playable on Steam. Now, I know a lot of people are going to look at these games made by like one or half a dozen people for comparatively close to a zero dollar budget and complain about the graphics. I'm just going to ignore you because for me personally, graphical fidelity is not really a consideration as again, I come from the era of text-based games. So I'll take a low fidelity indie game over a hundred million dollar triple A game, provided the indie game has the mechanics I'm looking for. Believe it or not, Despite streaming a lot of Elder Scrolls games between first person shooters, i.e. boomer shooters, 2D side scrolling platformers, hack and slash style Dynasty Warriors games and more, I can go months between major playthroughs of Bethesda games if it weren't for live streaming. I'll often say I have a like or a dislike of a certain genre, but it's really apparent that my likes and dislikes are more on a per game basis. For example, being quite stupid, I'm not really a fan of strategy games. I find them extremely stressful, and I don't really think several steps ahead. But regardless of that fact, Disgaea has my heart forevermore. It's a strategy RPG. So anyway, in the comments, I'd like to hear what games you are playing or looking forward to playing. What do you like about them? What draws you to them over others? I'm talking about like recent stuff, you know, like not necessarily recently, um, not necessarily recently released games, but Rather than thinking nostalgically back on something you played years ago, what are you playing right now? Like, what draws you to that game that you're playing, you know, in the moment, in the last month or so, and why? Now, if you'll excuse me, Christmas just came, and I've got a lot of great games to enjoy. I hope your new year is as pleasant.